The views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting, WYML LP, or its management, volunteers, or underwriters. Greetings and welcome to the Personal Safety Show. This is Marcus Melnick, your host from Fire Our Mentor and Stress to Logic. And we are going to be interviewing what I, the person who I would call is the most interesting person from the Midwest Security and Police Conference and Expo. But before we get into it, stay tuned because at the end of the interview, we will be discussing a new federal case that affects concealed carry in Illinois. Stay tuned. So I'd like to introduce Travis Hooker from CDO. And Travis was a speaker at the Midwest Security and Police Conference and Expo. I was not able to attend his seminars because I think we were going at the same time. But when I saw his background, his profile, I said, oh, my goodness, it's, a, it's very similar to mine in some respects. And I'd like to have him on the show. Travis, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Can you share with everyone what is your personal origin story? How did you get involved with criminal justice and how did that progress into CDO executives? I grew up in Elgin, Illinois. I've lived there pretty much my whole life. And at 16, I started as an explorer with the agency. I enjoyed that a great deal. And then that grew into, while I was doing my undergrad, I worked parking control uh, for the city and then hired as a police officer in 1997 uh, at the age of 22 and just recently retired as a lieutenant from the agency. During my tenure, I was a patrol officer I was a canine handler most of my career, then I was promoted as sergeant, so I worked all the different shifts as sergeant, then I was internal affairs, internal compliance, and then left as a lieutenant in charge of afternoon shift, where I had roughly 40 officers, five supervisors, and five civilians that reported to me. So that's kind of my background at the Belgian Police Department, how I got involved. How did that segue into CDO? About five or six years ago, I began to do some research into historically marginalized communities that maybe weren't getting the outreach that they deserved or needed from the police or have historically had communication barriers with police that have led to use of force incidences, whether they be justified or not, and how we could, as an agency, better communicate with these uh, groups to increase our knowledge better our community partnerships and decrease use of forces due to miscommunication. So one of the groups I came across was the LGBTQ community. um, And it's a very much state's rights issue. So it's a 10th amendment issue. So Illinois law is going to differ greatly than other states law. And I kind of began to take some training associated with that. And in doing that was able to learn more. And then I joined the American Bar Association and started getting involved in their various civil rights groups, one of them being sexual orientation, gender identity, under the Civil Rights Division, where I currently sit as vice chair. I have for the last two years been a vice chair on that committee. And I joined the Canadian Bar, International Bar as well, just to get different perspectives. And within that kind of took more training, met more people and was was able to establish a program in Elgin. So the first year we we had an Elgin Pride Squad. It's a squad car that we wrap for different months awareness. I had it all, it was all paid for by private funding. There was no city dollars that went into painting or not painting it, wrapping it. And I was in the Buffalo Grove Pride Parade that year, Aurora uh, and Chicago Pride, where we pulled a an ice cream cart that we have for the city. It's a trailer and we threw out popsicles. And for me, it's a civil rights issue. It's not a government issue. I'm not advocating for any political party. I am not woke. I'm merely illuminating the terrain in which we find ourselves deployed. And that's a quote from Captain Dale Dye. And trying to give officers the best tools they can so that they can better handle these interactions and build these community partnerships. That's a lot to unpack, but we're going to unpack yeah, it. I'm sorry. No, that's good. It's great. It was very robust and, and thorough. Thank you. It's, I didn't have to pull teeth to try to get you to answer a question. Made my life easy. Uh, Neil, I recently heard Neil deGrasse Tyson say something to the effect, I'm going to slaughter the quote, but he said, yeah. 
I'm not here to give you your opinion. I'm here to give you more information so your opinion is better informed. And I think that very appropriate for for what you do. Uh, yes, I would I, I would agree with that statement and encourage in all of my classes that I teach critical thinking. Right. Make your own decisions. But yes. whether you agree with something or not, it doesn't change what the law is today. Exactly. It's kind of funny you say that. I've on social media in a networking group I did post it was one of two Supreme Court federal Supreme Court cases that said the police don't have an obligation to protect individual citizens. And wow, I got a lot of hate mail on that. And I was like, I'm telling you what the Supreme Court said. It's not my opinion. It's theirs. And sometimes people don't realize that. Right. But in any event, I want to unpack. If, if I may. Oh, go ahead. And I hope we don't have a time limit. So forgive me. if I. All right. I just want to give you as much. as In that Supreme Court ruling that you speak of, specifically, it says police don't have or law enforcement doesn't have a duty or obligation to an individual person, but rather a duty and obligation to society as a whole. So that's kind of the, if that helps. Thank you for clarifying that. I was going off memory. You obviously have no. better memory than I, I do in that, in that. So one of the things you said about the Elgin Police Department, and you said a lot about them, all positive, you were the compliance sergeant. Does that mean accreditation? So I was I got involved in CALEA accreditation as an officer, as being part of the CALEA team, just because... I was a canine officer and I thought this is something totally different than what I was doing at the time. And I wanted to learn kind of the back end of how police departments work and policy and procedure. Uh, so I was on our CALEA team for our first CALEA certification, learned about proofs and everything that goes into it. And then we moved uh, to ILEAP and I was internal compliance at that time. I, we, I did not finish that process that I went uh, back to patrol and somebody else took over, but I was Part of the ILEAP process. I've also been to ILEAP training for assessors and just seeing the difference between Kalia and ILEAP. You know, I have my personal opinion on which one's easier. Oh, but, I know which one's you know, easier. <laughs> <laughs> but they're, you know, they're both pretty robust and I, I support police accreditation or anything public safety wise or public trust wise being accredited. One of the two seems to fit. Again, better for me. I'm not going to disparage one or the other, but just, you know, I encourage agencies and accreditation managers or any agency thinking of accreditation to do their own independent research and critical thinking on that to decide which program is best for them, whether it be a state level program or a national level program. So I'm going to connect with you. I was the accreditation manager for the Glencoe Police and Fire Department not only for law enforcement, but for firefighting also. I've had five on-sites, so I totally understand what you're doing. And like you, I started as a police explorer when Bill oh. Miller was the chief of the Skokie Police Department. I don't, I'm not sure if he was chief when you were there, was he? He was, yep. Okay. All right, so uh, I know he brought in Kalia to Skokie. It may have already been there when he joined the department. I don't. I, I don't recall. It was a long time ago. So he was our chief when we did CLE. I, chief Chuck Gruber was my first chief. Bill Miller was our second chief, or my second chief. And he was very involved in CLEA. Yes, that he brought that to Elgin. So I'm going to go back to another thing that you said about the bar associations. You are not a lawyer, correct? Correct. I am not an attorney. Oh, I'm glad I didn't insult you by calling you one. That was a joke. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so why join the ABAs, the various Canada, Illinois, United States? What's what's the benefit or how did that help your mission, your personal mission and professional mission? I wanted to make sure the pre uh, information I'm presenting and for my own personal edification is within current policy and law. And it differs, like I said, state to state, depending on what minority group I'm working with. There are some federal mandates. There's some federal case law. But then it really gets into a lot of state law. So I felt that was the best way to immerse myself. I hesitate to say this, but I did go to postgraduate studies in English common law out of the University of Coventry, which is in England, never went there, did it all online. And then I did um, a postgraduate studies through the University of Poldova, which is the partner agency for training international human rights for the United Nations International Court at The Hague, which the U.S. is not part of The Hague, um, 
But if you're a police officer, you have what's called a FEMA, a Federal Emergency Management number. If you've ever been to any of the incident command classes, you can take that FEMA number and register with the United Nations to take their education programs online for completely free. Uh, so that's what I did is I utilized that to do international studies. Um, and then Coventry University, I, I paid for that um, English common law. So with those, I wanted to see. So I, I started off with U.S., uh, but then I been reading and learning, found that Canada was different. And so wanted to see, okay, how do different governments handle constitutional law or if they don't have a constitution, like the U.K. does not have a constitution and different criminal justice systems in Germany, for example, it's called a constitutional democracy. And it's uh, and not that Germany has great history on civil rights, but since the 1950s, we'll say their social justice reform and then how they do trials now are less about attorneys presenting. It's less debate style and the judges do the interrogatives, the questioning. And it, the goal is to get at the truth versus who's the better debater. So in just learning different systems and how you know, we could apply those to, let's say we're doing a city ordinance violation. So it's a preponderance case versus a beyond a reasonable doubt, how we want to establish our arbitrators for those type of cases. And just looking at different ways to achieve the goal of getting to the truth and crime prevention while still holding people accountable, but hopefully able to turn mistakes that are made or criminal mistakes or crimes into protective members of society post conviction. So it was from a very robust background that I kind of joined those different bar associations and to surround myself with people that were much smarter than me and hoping that I could rise to the level of my incompetency to be the definition of the Peter principle. That's funny. I'm going to mess with you a little bit. What's mm -hmm. your middle initial? It does not start with J it's Allen, but I do have an autograph picture of William Shatner in his TJ Hooker outfit that hung in my office when I was with Elgin. Terrific. That's what I was going for. And then because you are a member, and I'm totally being facetious and kidding, but because yeah. you are a member of the ABA and you're not an attorney, now you know how a civilian feels working at a police department. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah. kind of understand that. Yeah. Yes. So that that's, I was a civilian. That's why I'm saying that. I also saw on your profile that you are a member of the Illinois LGBT, I don't know if there's a Q at the end of it, Chamber of Commerce. Can you tell everyone about what is the LGBTQ or not Q Chamber of Commerce? So there's no Q on it. Um, that is a Chamber of Commerce designed for small businesses that identify or ally with uh, LGBT people. So there's a lot of small businesses uh, in the state. The Illinois LGBT Chamber of Commerce actually is older than the national LGBT Chamber of Commerce. Started in 1996 by Lambda Legal. It's a group of small businesses that get together for the common goal. LGBT Chamber is, so I'll just call it the Chamber, is both a 5013C and a 501, I'm sorry, 501C3 and 501C6 with different rules on um, the ability to lobby and not lobby. Right. Um, so the, the C3 side, no lobbying. <clears throat> and what they do is uh, hold monthly networking events where we invite speakers to come in. We typically, it'll be a speaker typically from within the community. And then it'll be hosted at a member's venue. So members that want to highlight their venue or their product line, if you will, will host it. And then it's sponsored by um, different food and beverage companies who provide, you know, beer and wine and, right. and soda, and then some light hors d'oeuvres. And so that's kind of how it works for on a monthly basis. And then two big events a year are the winter soiree and the boat cruise. And really where this took off is the small business administration out of the U.S. government created a designation. So we have minority owned businesses, disabled owned businesses, veteran owned businesses, uh, women-owned businesses, well, one of the designation for small business set-asides is LGBT business enterprise. So it's LGBTBE. <clears throat> and the Small Business Administration does not certify business. They do 8As or 8Cs. They will certify small business. But if you're also a small business who's minority-owned, they contract with, for lack of a better term, subject matter experts 
for your national certification as a minority owned business. So in this case, they contract with the national LGBT Chamber of Commerce for that certification as an LGBTBE for set asides. And then what happens if you're in Illinois, if you join the Illinois Chamber, your membership with nationals is actually free because Illinois predates nationals and the process to be certified as a LGBT business enterprise is also included. So that normally $900 if someone were just to pay for it directly through the NGLCC. Once you fill out the application with them, they send it to Illinois and then Illinois does what's called the on-site or just verification right. and sends back a form and then nationals will issue you your minority owned business letter and you get a certificate that's good for three years. So you can bid contract jobs for not only small business set asides, but also as a minority owned business. That was a way long answer to a short okay. question. But. <laughs> can you tell us about CDO executives and what else do they do? What other services do they offer to the public safety community? Yeah. So CDO executives, it, it merely stands for typically CDO was uh, historically your chief data officer. Now they're called not that same position, but they've kind of reclaimed that title to mean chief diversity officer, which can kind of be an ugly word right now. But that's basically what it stands for, chief diversity officers. We offer training, policy update, pre-crisis and post-crisis response to critical incidents associated with silent minorities. So people you wouldn't necessarily know we're a minority based on their outward appearance. The story I like to tell is shortly after the George Floyd incident, I was going into the local supermarket. I was taking off my uniform shirt, so I was just wearing a t-shirt. And I'm asking myself, why am I taking this off? Well, I don't want to be judged based on the job I do. I don't want people to judge me uh, because I'm a police officer. But what if it was something I could not take off? What if it was the color of my skin? What if it was the fact that I was a woman or I was deaf and had trouble communicating? So that kind of led me into creating programs for other silent minorities. So we offer training and policy, like I said, as it associates with the deaf community, interactions with and community bridge building, people with autism and their caregivers, those with mental and or physical health disabilities, destigmatizing proactive mental health and law enforcement, community partnerships, building with minority religions and cultures. Within those, it depends on the demographic of the agency and what they're seeking, but I can do in no particular order, Buddhism, Tao, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Sikh, I think I got all of them there, and then the subsets within Christianity. And so those are some of the services we offer and as far as outreach. And then I do other things like policy updates and reviews as it just associates with the agency, how to create civilian oversight review boards, which has kind of become a big thing, supervisor training programs. So it's it's pretty robust uh, in, the, in the offerings that we have. And it's, they're each, it's not like cookie cutter where you just grab it off the shelf and it it's very individualized for the agency, the demographic, and then the programs we create take into consideration what local resources are around that agency, depending on what the topic we're talking about. So it's, it's very individualized for each agency and then written within current case law, uh, state law. And we'll touch on issues that are of high importance at that particular time or where I see the law maybe going. And I separate it out between this is what it is now, this is what it was, and this is where it looks like it's going, but we can't predict the future. Very good. What conferences do you regularly attend to speak at? So I do the, I, this is the third year I've done the Illinois Association of Chiefs of Police Midwest Security and Police Expo. I also did uh, ILESPE, Illinois Law Enforcement Training Standards Board, the Federal Reserve for in Chicago. I've done some training for them, Chase Manhattan, Chase Bank, the National NGLCC Conference, which was in Palm Springs this year. Well, I grew up in the deaf community. I'm Jewish. I went to a synagogue in Skokie for the deaf and hard of hearing. And part of the Sunday school curriculum was actually learning deaf culture and American Sign Language. So that's what really drew me to you. So what specifically do you teach to police officers regarding the deaf community? 
there is a program, and sadly, not many officers are aware of it. If if I go do the training, is it's called the J eighty eight program, and it's in the state of Illinois. And do you have you ever heard of the J eighty eight program? Only in the program that I got from the Midwest Security Police Expo that talks about your seminar. So this gotcha. is the first I've heard of it. Okay. So the J88 program is if you're a person who's hard of hearing and or deaf on your driver's license, you can have under, it's under the restriction category, but it's not really a restriction, J88 added. And that, so when police officers run your name in the computer that, that they pull you over or dispatch is taking the call and they run people uh, through the computer system, the J88 designation means that you're deaf or hard of hearing. So we can front load the police with information on their way to handle the call that there might be a communication barrier before they even get there. We can know before we pull somebody over, if I see a J88 designation on the driver's license return, that there may be a communication barrier when I approach this vehicle. Um, It also allows us to pre-plan for how we're going to mitigate that and have policies and procedures in place to better interact with the deaf community. Why is it problematic for a police officer during an arrest to handcuff somebody who is deaf who only speaks with sign language? Because you're taking away their ability to communicate at that point. Um, That would be like putting a piece of tape across somebody who speaks mouth. They're not going to be able to communicate. That's going to add a stress level to an already stressful situation. Additionally, when you take their hands away from them, their ability to communicate with you is hampered. And then they still can't hear you. It's not going to make them hear just because they're handcuffed. So then there's some worry on, you know, are you going to guide them? Are you going to walk them? What do you want them to do? Because they can't hear what you're asking them to do. Uh, So that's a problem. Uh, During COVID, additionally, a lot of people in the deaf community have adapted to read lips pretty well. Uh, And if we have a mask on that's covered, you know, covers your face, they're not going to be able to read your lips. They do have clear masks out there that are available for, you know, if COVID were to come back, but that was a a big issue with the deaf community. And really some use of force incidences that have arisen because a person who's deaf doesn't hear the verbal commands what the officer is doing. And the officer misreads that to think that the person isn't, you know, responding correctly or listening or doing what the officer asks. So those are all big issues within the deaf community. And it's, Roughly 4% of the population suffers from some form of hearing loss. So 4% of 330 million people in the United States. It's a pretty significant number. And I'm just going to add a couple things in this is that the deaf community typically has their own subculture. They have deaf camps for kids. They have social outreach programs. They have community programs. And getting involved in these grassroots community efforts will help build those partnerships Um, with their local police, social service agencies, and better interact, help decrease our, as police officers, implicit bias, which then hopefully will decrease explicit bias. Just to open up our minds in different ways of thinking, and, and it is a fairly large portion of the population. And then when you take into consideration for your example, not only are did you come up from the deaf community, but you also came up from, well, not in Skokie, a minority religion, but it is a minority religion in the United States. And with Judaism having its own culture behind it, and even those people who don't identify necessarily as Jewish religion, but still may define Jewish culture. You know, you get within the subsets of those, it, it makes connecting even more difficult for local agencies. And they're typically closed communities. So when you need to do investigations and follow-ups, it's important that you have the tools in your toolbox to be able to best communicate, taking into account all those, those factors. So you said a buzzword, you said internal, and then you said external bias. And I want Mm -hmm. to explain to the listeners, because this, this is a concept that's newer to me, the the whole internal bias. And I have an example specific to the deaf community. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, we had, I had a babysitter. I mean, I was a kid. And she had a sixth grade education. She was a, a one of the original Skokie farmers. She never attended school past sixth grade. And we had a neighbor who was deaf, and she would call them the deaf and dumb. And you know, that's what they were always referred to. They're not dumb. So that's right. an internal bias that uh, I, I think, at least today, I haven't heard that term, which is fantastic. So it's kind of 
moving out of the world of bias, but at the same time, you might have an old timer who will think that. So my follow-up question is, as a police officer, you have to, when you're transporting a prisoner, or if you're going to make an arrest, you have to somehow secure them. So how would you secure somebody who is deaf? I wouldn't change the way I secure them. What I would change is the way I communicate with them what's going on. So I would encourage agencies to look out there. There are programs available. I suggest one where they have 24-7 access to a communication software. It's available on your smartphone, on your tablet, whatever you may need. So much like if we have uh, somebody who's not a primary English speaker, we try to find a translator and we really have a duty and obligation to interview a person under their native language or the language they best understand. Additionally, if we're going to do post-arrest interviews, you have to apply Miranda, but they have to understand Miranda. Um, so having access to a 24-7 translator for both spoken and ASL is, is of super importance. So with that said, I would bring up my ASL and translator on my phone who is it's like a FaceTime thing. I introduce myself, I tell them what's going on, and then they can sign it to the person that I'm arresting. And then that person can sign back if they have any questions or don't understand, you know, and we can kind of have a better communication and then let them know, hey, this is what we have to do. Our policy says I have to handcuff you. It's only while you're in the back seat of a squad car when we get to the jail. I will unhandcuff you, and then I will again give you access to an ASL interpreter to answer any questions and then also help you because they're still entitled to their three phone calls. You know, do, we, do you have a TDY machine in your jail? Do you have the ability to bring up a FaceTime app so that they can contact their loved ones that do understand ASL? Um, so just explaining all those processes. And then if a question comes up, just bring the interpreter back in to the mix so that there's no miscommunication and it helps reduce stress on both the officer and the person. When I was growing up, we had a really similar app. It was called a pencil and paper. And I'm being facetious when I say it. Well, yeah. we really did. I mean, that's how a lot of deaf people communicated. They'd have a little notepad. And when they would go to a restaurant, they would write down what they wanted because yeah. invariably with 4% of the population, it's not a language that is i mean you can still learn it in school but it's not as prominent or common as spanish polish russian etc right. when we return we will be continuing the conversation stay tuned the views expressed are not those of local community broadcasting wymlp or its management volunteers or underwriters <laughs> 